The Constitution. Sources of governmental power in the original Constitution. Remember, the original Constitution is talking about before the Bill of Rights. So the body of the Constitution as originally passed. There's three clauses specifically that greatly expanded federal power. The first of these is the Supremacy Clause. All three of these, this entire video, in fact, every single thing on here is quite commonly tested. The Supremacy Clause states that when federal and state laws conflict, so the federal law says one thing, the state law says the opposite, so they go against each other, the federal law is superior. So you can think about marijuana. Right now we have a federal law saying marijuana is illegal. We have state laws, places like Colorado, Washington State, etc., that have legalized marijuana. So those two laws are conflicting. And so if it went to the Supreme Court, what would be the likely outcome is that they would strike down the state laws because the federal law is superior, according to the Supremacy Clause, every time. Additionally, we have the Necessary and Proper Clause. This is also known as the Elastic Clause. Either of those terms could be used on the AP test, interchangeable, again. Now, the Necessary and Proper Clause, what this is going to do, it's going to give Congress a lot of power. It is found in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, and if you recall, we talked about implied powers. Implied powers are those that aren't directly stated in the Constitution, but yet they are still claimed by Congress. And so hopefully the question came to your mind, well, why is Congress allowed to claim those powers? The reason is this clause, this necessary and proper clause. I want you to look at the very bottom for a second. This is a quote, this is from Article 1, Section 8. This is the last lines of that article. It says, The Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. The word foregoing means preceding, the ones that came before. So what this does in practice is it allows Congress to make laws that they feel to be necessary for them to carry out their expressed powers. Now you notice that I've underlined the second part of both of those lines. The reason for that is I don't want there to be confusion. The Necessary and Proper Clause does not allow Congress to make any law. Their power is still limited. So they cannot simply make any law they want and be like, oh, it's necessary and proper. They cannot do that. They can make laws and use this necessary and proper clause if they feel that that law is necessary in order to carry out their expressed powers. So it has to match something else that was listed. It has to go along with some of their written down, expressed, enumerated powers. That is when they can use this. It's a very, very important distinction to know. And thirdly, we have the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause is maybe the easiest one. It gave Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. Now, what is commerce? Commerce is anything having to do with trade or money, okay? So sometimes that word commerce throws people. Commerce, trade, and money. So any, anything involving interstate money, trade, jobs, companies, work, driving across state lines, anything. Interstate means between states. So what that means is if you cross state lines and you are doing something illegal, that becomes now a federal crime. So Congress, they have the power to regulate anything that has to do with more than one state. This is going to give Congress a lot of power, and we'll talk about why in just a couple slides. Overall, the effect of these three clauses the Necessary and Proper Clause, the Supremacy Clause, and the Commerce Clause has been to greatly expand federal power, and if we wanted to be even more specific, we could say it has greatly expanded congressional power. So they have grown quite strong as a result of these three clauses. Now, going along with the three clauses, we have two very, very important Supreme Court cases. This one right here, McCulloch versus Maryland, this is the second most important Supreme Court case of this entire year. The first one was Marbury versus Madison, we did earlier. The second one, McCulloch versus Maryland. This took place in 1819 and asked the question, asked two questions actually. Can Congress create a national bank and can a state tax the national government? Because basically what was happening here was the national government, the Congress, had made a bank, a national bank, um, 
and some people felt like they didn't even have that power. So they had one of the branches of the bank was located in Maryland, and Maryland tried to tax that bank because they wanted to get rid of that bank. So basically, can a state rebel against the national government is what it's really asking. So could Congress create the national bank? If you look in the Constitution, you will find nowhere does it state Congress can make a national bank. However, as you see, the answer to the question is, in fact, yes. Congress can create a national bank. The reason for that, and this is what's important on this, well, you need to know everything about this case. You need to know the two questions, you need to know the answers and the clauses that back them up. So why could Congress create a national bank? Because the Supreme Court believed that it was necessary and proper. So it was the elastic clause or the necessary and proper clause that allowed Congress to make a national bank. Well, why was it necessary and proper? Because some of Congress's other powers were to tax, to borrow money, to coin money. And so the Supreme Court said it is reasonable that it's necessary that if they can do those things involving money, that they can. They are allowed to have a national bank. So they said yes to that question. The second question, can a state tax the national government? Because that's what Maryland was trying to do, is trying to tax the national government. The answer to that is no, and that's because of the supremacy clause. The national government is supreme. It is superior to the states and states cannot tax it or try to limit the national government. Again, this is a landmark case, the second most important case of this entire year. Um, you will see this on your mock tests, you will see it on your unit one test, you'll see it on your midterm, you will see this over and over again. You need to know everything about this McCulloch versus Maryland case. And lastly, we have Gibbons versus Ogden. Um, this is a case involving the Commerce Clause. And what happens here, is it's again agrees that Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce. That's nothing new. However, their interpretation of what interstate commerce is was very, very broad. And we have continued for the last almost 200 years, the last 190 years, to have a very broad interpretation of what exactly interstate commerce is. So what that means is if it has anything to do with commerce and is cross state lines, anything about your business, then Congress is allowed to make a law about it. So let me give you a very, it's going to sound unrealistic, but it actually is a realistic example. If you own a restaurant in the city of Pimmer Pines, and it's only one restaurant, there are no more in the whole country, you might argue, okay, that's intrastate commerce, meaning I'm just within one state. However, according to the way that the Commerce Clause is currently interpreted, the Supreme Court would likely argue that that is in fact interstate commerce and that Congress can make laws about it. So you might wonder, how could that be? My restaurant is in one city, one state only. They can look at things like, well, where do your customers come from? And you might argue, my customers all live in Pimmer Pines too. Okay, that's fine. But what about what are you serving? Did any of the food, anything in your restaurant come from another state? Did the booths, the tablecloths, the ketchup bottles, were they manufactured in another state? Anything, if any single thing in your restaurant came from another state, then they can argue that you are now engaging in interstate commerce and therefore they can make laws that affect you and your business. So again, what's happening here? Congress is gaining more and more power. So supremacy, necessary and proper, and elastic clause, or sorry, and commerce clause, all three of them have greatly expanded federal power.